Welcome back. And I'm very pleased to introduce us to a, a speaker that really needs no introduction, but I'll introduce him anyway. Uh, Simeon and the Delphi Economic Forum had the foresight to call this a conference on the Eastern Mediterranean. And I'd like to point out that in U.S. policy, there is no bureaucracy that strictly deals with the Eastern Mediterranean. There's not an Eastern Mediterranean Bureau in the State Department. There's not an Eastern Mediterranean subcommittee on the Senate or House Foreign Affairs committees. But now there will be a construct for Eastern Mediterranean policy because of the leadership of Senator Bob Menendez. Because he took charge and authored and helped pass and forced through the Eastern Mediterranean Security and Energy Partnership Act, the whole U.S. foreign policy establishment has to start thinking in terms of an Eastern Mediterranean. His remarks will reflect this strategy and a new approach. Um, and while I can say a lot about Senator Menendez and his decades of Phil Hellenism and principal leadership in American foreign policy, and especially on Eastern Mediterranean issues, I could think of no better validator and endorser than the late Paul Sarbanes, who in, when in 2005, he told the community he wasn't running again for reelection. The community was distraught. I can remember the session. People were asking, what can we do? What should we do? And Senator Sarbanes simply said, make sure you reelect Bob Menendez. That was prescient. It was true. And with that, Senator Bob Menendez. I would like to thank the Delphi Economic Forum and all of the conference organizers for inviting me to briefly share my perspective on the Eastern Mediterranean region and U.S. interests in the region. When we met in November of last year, the Eastern Mediterranean Security and Energy Partnership Act was still pending in the United States Senate. Today, it is law, and already we've seen it yield positive results. We have seen a further deepening of the U.S. security relationship with Greece. We have seen lifting of arms and export restrictions on Cyprus and the beginning of a U.S. military education and training program with the Republic. Simply put, we have seen remarkable progress in a very short period of time. Due to bipartisan support in the House and the Senate and in cooperation with leaders in the executive branch, like Ambassador Jeff Pyatt, we can confidently say today that the U.S. relationships with Greece and Cyprus are as strong as they have ever been. That doesn't mean, however, that we don't face real challenges in the region. Turkish aggression has only increased over this year in the Eastern Med, North Africa, the Middle East, and the South Caucasus. We've witnessed violations of Greek airspace, illegal exploration efforts in Greek and Cypriot waters, and offensive violations of UN Security Council resolutions in Famagusta. Without a resolute response, this unchecked aggression will only continue. I was disappointed that the European Union did not take stronger measures last week. I fear that leaders across Europe will end up regretting their decision, as we are likely to see a further emboldened Ankara in the coming months. In the Senate, I have led bipartisan efforts to ensure that Turkey is held accountable under U.S. law. The July 2019 purchase of the Russian S-400 system posed a significant threat to NATO and our allies in Europe. It was sanctionable under the CATSA statute, so we had a simple request for the administration. Follow the law. And while the administration's delay was inexcusable, I was glad to see these sanctions finally imposed this week, and I will work to ensure full enforcement. I hope that this bipartisan resolve sends a clear message to Ankara Brussels and beyond that the United States Congress will not allow Turkish aggression to continue unabated. We do not believe that malign behavior should be met with disinterest or worse yet, rewarded. At this event last year, I said this is the dawn of a new era 
in American support for the Eastern Mediterranean, a prime opportunity if we have the will, the energy, and the courage to pursue it. This sentiment still holds true. As President-elect Biden takes office next month, I am confident that his administration will sustain this momentum and further deepen our relationships. Turkey, Russia, and China's goals in the region dramatically differ from our own. I believe President-elect Biden recognizes the Eastern Mediterranean's importance for U.S. strategy in the region. I expect that the Biden administration will stand up for U.S. national security interests when it comes to Turkey, something we have not seen in recent years. And I expect that it will seek to hold Erdogan to account in close cooperation with our friends in the region. And if for whatever reason the Biden administration were to stray from the principles of the Eastern Mediterranean Security and Energy Partnership Act, I will not hesitate to speak out as I always have. Friends, next year we will celebrate the historic 200th anniversary of Greek independence. Lord Byron, who died before the end of the war, famously wrote in his poem, The Isles of Greece, and I quote, The mountains look on Marathon, and Marathon looks on the sea, and musing there an hour alone, I dream that Greece might still be free. Next March, we will celebrate this hard-won freedom. We will celebrate our shared vision for an Eastern Mediterranean architecture rooted in security and shared prosperity. And we will celebrate the shared democratic values that have roots in ancient Greek history and that we must carry forward together for generations to come. I look forward to this celebration and seeing you all in person next year. Thank you, Efaristo.